Hi everybody, I'm Dave Butler. I'm Emily Freeman. Welcome to Don't Miss This. It's our move through the scriptures studying time. <laughs> Remember I was going to try and think of I know, my mom's been worried all week how you were going to introduce That it. was horrible. I'm so sorry, Grandma Les. So, but um, that was a bad intro for a really, really good week, which is Holy Week this week. Um, depending on when you were watching this, we... Happy conference coming up because some of you will watch this the week leading up to conference and then some of you will start watching this or listening right after conference. But whichever one that is, we're before conference. So happy conference and now happy Holy Week. Yeah, we love Holy Week. If you've been with us a long time, you already know this about us. Um, if you're new to us, we love that in a lot of other Christian faiths, this is called a High Holy Week. And we love the thought of that, just this high holiday time where you're gathering and you're worshiping and uh, just talking about Christ every single day. Yeah, and it's kind of one that sneaks up on you because it changes dates kind of based off of the lunar calendar. And so sometimes it sneaks up and you don't really get a chance to really embrace and like fall into it like you do Christmas. And so that's one of the things we're going to talk about today as we teach kind of everything that happens in Holy Week. The church this week, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, if you're not a member of our faith, created a Holy Week schedule. And it kind of gives you a mini lesson. And then we're going to add on to that mini lesson an invitation for each day of the week for Holy Week. So we're going to have many three to five minute segments on this video. And if you're a podcaster, you might want to watch the video clips and move through the chapters with your family or, or something like that if you have something like that, um, a group. Um, but we're going to give a mini lesson and a invitation for each of the days of Holy Week. Now, you can get on to churchofjesuschrist.org, the website, and search for Easter Study Plan. Or if you go to your app and go into the library. In the, the church app. Yeah, the um, church the app. The Gospel Living app is the library. One you want. The Gospel oh, the Library. Gospel library yes. app. I'm going to confuse everybody. Yeah. The Gospel Library um, app. The top left section is called Jesus Christ. Click into that and then you will see the Easter study plan. Top left thing to click and it will give you an intro and then Show people the lesson what that looks for like each on the of the days. Screen if they're watching on the yeah. video so they can kind of this see. This is the Jesus section and it's just this top left and right up here. Let them see what the study looks like. Uh, it's just a list like this. And then when you open up the days, they look like this and you can just print them out. Um, if you do it from your computer or print them from your phone, and then you can just have that for the entire week. Um, some of the things that we're going to be inviting you into, if you want to be prepared, if you want to go the week ahead and get everything so you are just prepared and ready to go, um, and then you can just turn on each video and maybe you'll have an Easter basket that is filled with all of these things. So you'll want... Uh, Jesus-centered Easter decorations of some sort. We put some of our favorite up here just in case. Um, we love this Easter scene, and I love having Easter decorations out for the purpose of last week when uh, Desi and Luca were here. I was peeking around the kitchen corner, and he had her standing in front of this, and he had his arm just over her shoulder, and he was like, and then the soldiers came, and then he carried his cross, and then, oh, and he prayed at, on the rock, he told her, he prayed on the rock, and then he died, he told her, but don't worry, because now <laughs> he's alive again. And I was like, oh, I love that at like the age of three, four, and five, you can have decorations that are teaching, so you'll want Easter-centered decorations, um, a $5 bill for everyone in your family, for one of the days, a little red thread, just a tiny red thread for one of the days. Put together a worship playlist. Um, you're gonna wanna grab some Easter lilies. You might wanna order those ahead or like if you go to your grocery store, sometimes they have big, a big supply of those. And then you're gonna want yellow onion skins and some eggs to dye for the Sunday activity. So if you just had all of that, you would be right, ready to go. And I just want to say one more other thing about this study that's taking place on the Gospel Library app. It's set up this year in a really unique way that it can be a shared study, which means you can follow along with your family. Um, but if you have kids away from home like we do, it's so fun just to say to everyone, go on the Gospel Library app, 
go to Monday. We'll all do the lesson together. There's going to be a question at the end of every lesson, and maybe you'll start an Easter group thread just for that whole week where your family can write in, what is your answer to the question? What are you doing with the invitation? Um, you'll study that together. Uh, you might do it like Grace with a group of young single adults. Um, your seminary class could totally do Easter week together or your young women's group or your young men's group yeah. um, could follow along. So if you go on there and then you'll just want to start a group me or a text or a shared notes or something where you can all be commenting all week long this week what your study looks like. So we're going to jump in to the first day, which will be Sunday, April 2nd. Yeah, and let me give this little tip. You might watch these the night before so that you kind of are thinking about what happened on that day. Uh, Bible scholars go back and forth about which, which things happened on which day. It's kind of hard to figure out the chronology in there. But if you're gonna kind of follow the traditional, like, oh, Sunday was this day, you might want to watch the video the night before so you can think about it, or you can watch it the night of and just celebrate the tradition or whatever the next day. So yeah, and if you're going to do that, you would want to start on Saturday, April 1st would be, you'll watch the first video and then be ready for what comes that next day. Yeah. But so if fun. you're off, oh, well, you just do it. However. Yeah. And, and that <laughs> and is our, if fine. you miss one of the days or two of the days and you only catch three, it's just about getting some of Holy Week into it's your life. It's just setting it apart in some way. So, ready? Okay. So, here, here we, we go. go. Day one. All right. Palm Sunday might be my most favorite day of the entire year besides Easter Sunday. It's going to second. Are you going to do yeah. show that little thing I better first? Show yeah. This. yeah. Um, if you are doing the tip ins with us, there is a Holy Week tip in for this entire week that you'll be able to follow along with all of the reading. If you want to know what the reading is for every single day, we pulled that out for you to be able to do that. Um, so Palm Sunday is going to start in Matthew 21 or in Mark 11. You'll be able to find it in either place. We're going to go into Matthew. Okay. This day is just, I love it because my spirit has a celebratory spirit and it has a <laughs> shouting spirit and it has like a, you know, triumphant kind of vibe to it. And so I love this day. I love Jesus will ride from the Mount of Olives coming from the town that he's been staying in on the donkey, which was the Jewish symbol for royalty. And his followers are there in the city and they start to lay down their clothes in his path. And they start to cut palm branches down from the trees and lay them down, which again was a symbol of high respect and, and uh, to acknowledge royalty coming in. And then they started to wave them, it says. And it says in chapter 21, if you go down to verse 9, it says, And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. That word Hosanna, you'll find in this little intro, if you have the, if you print these pages out or look on the app, it just says, the people surrounded Jesus with love and praise, shouting Hosanna, a phrase that means save us. So it was this one word, exuberant, I don't even know if that's a word, you know, just cry out. You know, it was celebratory, but also it was a petition. Yeah, like right? a prayer. Yes, it was just a, it was a like, one word prayer. Save us and we know you can at the same time. And there were others, it says, in the city who heard these people crying out and shouting and it would have made a scene. And they're like, wait, what's going on? All the city was moved, it said in verse 10. And some of the people said, who is this? Why are you shouting this? What is causing all of this? And it says in verse 11, and the multitude said back, this is Jesus. And we love to imagine that crowd of people. Who would have been there? It would have been people that would have been impacted by his teaching and his ministry in some way. Maybe some of the people that we met in the chapters already. Maybe the woman who reached out on the roadside. Maybe the leper was in the group. Maybe the blind man that he healed on the day of compassionate detours. Maybe the father of the son. We, we don't know who was there, but, we, but it certainly would have been people who were impacted by his teachings and ministry in some way. And when everybody else was like, what is causing this response from you? Their answer simply was, this is Jesus. And he is one who came to save, which is why we're yelling this out. 
And so as you begin this Easter week, maybe you want to think about this question. How do you need him to save you right now? How do you need him to heal you? How do you need him to help you and what will you do this week to bring him in the invitation that comes from um, this easter plan is how can you invite jesus and his accompanying joy more into your life this week start the week off with a triumphal entry and think to yourself what am i going to do to bring him into my home and into my heart and into my celebrations this week oh i love that one so much Okay, day two is going to be Monday, and um, as we think about this one, what happened on this day is the cleansing of the temple. And I love when you read that in Matthew 21, in verse 12, Jesus goes to the temple, and the very first thing he does is cast out anyone who buys and sells in the temple, and he overthrows the table of money changers and the seats of those who were selling the doves in the temple. And he says, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you are making it a den of thieves. And it's so interesting when you watch this happen because it feels so different from the Jesus that we right. know. Right. That, that you're like, oh, whoa, what is happening right Especially now? Especially this picture where yeah. you think he's about to whip that dude yeah. in the neck. And in the <laughs> temple. And... I love that what is actually happening on Monday is he is clearing out the distraction. Um, Even if it means overturning things in a life, to clear out the distraction, to clear out what is preventing the real work that is meant to be happening in a life. And I love that we find out what that real work is because he first of all tells us this is actually supposed to be a house of prayer. That's what this house is. And and when we go to the temple, it is that place of communicating with heaven. But I also love what we learn in verse 14. It says, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And I think it's so interesting that the blind and the lame actually could not get in to this place the way that it was, and I love how it's portrayed in this picture because there was no room for them. It was too loud, it was too full, there was too much going on for healing to take place. And sometimes that's true in our own life, that there is too much going on for healing to take place. And so maybe Monday represents for us clearing out space for him in your life. Yesterday, you decorated your home for him. Today, we're preparing the inner vessel to receive him. And that means overturning some things and removing distractions. I love what Michelle Craig said several years ago in conference. She said, as I pray for the Lord to open my eyes to see things I might not normally see, I often ask myself two questions and pay attention to the, question, to the impressions that come. And these are her two questions. What am I doing that I should stop doing? Mm. And the next one is, what am I not doing that I should start doing? And so we've called this day begin with a question. And if you go into this cleansing of the temple, that's going to be with the study that we're all doing together. I love this question that says, how can you cleanse your own heart and mind to prepare yourself to hear Jesus's teachings. So I love that Monday is a day of just preparing the inner vessel. And whether that's uh, spiritually, physically, schedule-wise, whatever it is, it's just like almost Holy Week becomes this pattern for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Like, let me ready, move some things out so more Jesus can come in, more healing can come in. And for sure, we want to do that Holy Week, but... Why not? Always. Always, right? Yeah, so good. Okay, welcome to Tuesday, which we are calling $5 Tuesday. And that is the invitation, which we're (laughs) going to talk to you about in in just a second. Um, This is a day that a lot of people think Jesus spent teaching in the temple. As you read in the Gospels, particularly in the book of Matthew, you find a lot of probably teachings that you're really familiar with to crowds of people 
sometimes to just the disciples in a smaller group, sometimes one-on-one because of questions that were asked. But it seems that Jesus spent a lot of this day in the temple. During the festivals, um, like Passover, which is happening at this time, the temple would have been jam-packed with people. So it would have been a great opportunity for teaching large groups or one-on-ones of people who found him somewhere in that big temple complex. Um, when you look at this, uh, the paper that gets printed out on the Easter plan, it says this in the beginning, in Jerusalem, Jesus was surrounded by supporters and critics alike. As the master teacher, he never let an opportunity to share his wisdom go to waste. And it's really neat that you can see that in this chapter 22 Um, In particular, people will come up and they ask their questions and he takes a chance to answer them. Uh, Some you might know is um, people were just like, are you supposed to pay your taxes? And remember, he answers, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and unto God that which is God's. The widow's might story is in there. There's just lots that you're familiar with that people came and asked questions. One of these things about the critics, though, you'll notice is during this time, they were coming to try and trip him up. And they're trying to complicate, you know, and get him trapped in some of his words, pin him against two different teachings or laws or scriptures or something like that. And one of my favorite teachings of Jesus in all of this section happens here. And I love it in particular because Jesus seems to simplify what living the gospel um, and living the law of scripture is all about. And a lawyer comes up to him and he tries to tempt him, it says in verse 35 of Matthew 22, asking him a question saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And he answers back and he says, oh, that's simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love the neighbor, thy neighbor as thyself. And I just love that Jesus, like he tries to like, oh, let's pit two groups up against each other. And he just says, no, let me make this really simple for you. Love God and love people. He says, on this hangs all the law of the prophets. This is what all the scriptures and all the prophets and all the inspiration was trying to teach. The question they ask in here is, how can you apply the lessons of the scriptures into your own life? And I think it's neat that Jesus kind of said, like, that's kind of a big question. Like, oh, all the lessons of Scripture? And Jesus is like, oh, I can simplify for you (laughs) what all the lessons of Scripture were leading to you, leading you to, to love God and to love people. That simple. So the invitation for this day on Tuesday or whenever you live this out is an invitation to exercise that, um, that teaching, to love people. So You might give to everybody in your family a $5 bill or a $1 bill or go big, go $6, um, (laughs) whatever you want to do and give everybody in the family just that open invitation. Spend this in some way that you're going to love on somebody. Buy them a treat, leave it on a car window, whatever, whatever. Pay it forward. I love paying forward things. Yeah. Don't you just want to go with your whole family and then say, pay for the car behind us with this much of the money yeah so or as can, many cars as it takes who wants to go to a drink place and just be like use this till it runs out as many cars yeah it's so rad so you can adjust this and do it however you like um but some way to live out that grand great teaching of jesus that's so beautiful and simple to love god which by definition means to love people Wednesday is one of my favorite days of Holy Week, which is interesting because it's the only day we really have no idea what even took place. The scriptures are actually silent about Wednesday. And for me, I love to think that maybe that was a private day for Jesus. Maybe that was a day of rest and of gathering strength. But some also wonder if it might have been a day of miracles. And I love the thought of that, that if Jesus could go about doing anything on his last free day, um, what would he have done? And I think he would have just loved people. I think you would have seen him out um, doing miracles and and bringing healing and, and doing what he loved so much. And as we think about this one in the study that we're doing with the church, they talk about a miracle that happened right before Holy Week begins. And it's the miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus from the tomb. 
And I love this one line from the study, from our study, just a short time before Jesus had visited Bethany to raise his friend Lazarus from the dead. After seeing this miracle, many people in the town believed Jesus to be the Son of God. And I love this thought today for Wednesday before Easter to see the miracles, to really take time to pause and to rest and to look for where are the miracles in your life. I love when you go to John 11, which is where that story happened. And he says to Martha, he's asking her um, about her brother. And she says, I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And then in verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then he says to her, believest thou this? And I just love the thought of that really deep belief in that Mm. moment. Do you believe in miracles? Is that how you live your life? I love that President Russell M. Nelson has given us that invitation to seek for miracles, to look for miracles, to actually expect miracles in our life. And in the study, it says, the Lord will bless you with miracles if you believe in him, doubting nothing. Do the spiritual work to seek miracles. Prayerfully ask God to help you exercise that kind of faith. I promise you can experience for yourself that Jesus Christ gives power to the faint and to them that hath no might, he increases strength. And I love as he talks about this idea of expecting miracles, what that looks like. When we were in Israel last year, we walked down to the wall on a Thursday evening. And on our way down there, there were women sitting all through the old city with big baskets that had um, red threads, red um, pieces of yarn or thin thread in their baskets. And as we walked through, I kept saying to David, what are those? We were in a hurry. We were like racing to get down there. And but I was like, what, what is the meaning of the red thread? I'm dying to know the meaning of the red thread. So I finally, once we got close enough that I wasn't going to get lost, if I stopped, I paused <laughs> at one of the women and said, what is the meaning of the red thread? And she said, oh, it means you will experience luck or blessing um, for as long as you wear it until it falls off. And so I bought one, they were a dollar, and I bought this little red thread and I've actually had it on all this year. I wear it all the time on my wrist and I've had it on this whole year. And every time I look down at it, it just reminds me of that word blessing, that I should expect blessings in my life. And as you go through Wednesday, the invitation from this study that we're doing on the Gospel Library app all together is what miracles has Jesus Christ made possible in your life? And that's something I want to reflect on all day today Mm. is what are the miracles that I have experienced this year and what have they taught me about him? And maybe you'll tie this red thread on Um, with your family or with the group that you are studying with wherever they are or give a text out to all your kids to go put on that red thread and wear it till it falls off and have it be that reminder daily not just on Wednesday but for a year where are you seeing the blessings of the Lord in your life yeah past and future like remember them and And then anticipate them yeah look for them right just let that be a day that and Wednesday, it, makes, it feels like that, doesn't it? Yes. He was like a day with friends. You know, it was just like, oh, and what would you have experienced if, yes. we, if we were together? It's such a, Wednesday's a sweet day. Yes. At least we hope. We don't yes. know, but we hope. <laughs> All right, Thursday. Uh, typically, most people believe that Thursday is a day where uh, the celebration of the Passover was beginning. So Jesus would have gathered together with all of his disciples, and they found this place that they called the Upper Room and gathered together, and they were going to share a meal with each other. And if you were with us last year or know the story of the Exodus, that was the purpose of that meal, to remember their deliverance 
from Egypt and they never wanted to forget that. Sort of like what yesterday's, Wednesday's thing was. Mm -hmm. Like remember the miracles. Remember you're a people of miracles. You worship a God of miracles. And they gathered for this um, day and Jesus will kind of switch the script. We'll talk about this in a future lesson, but he changes the story of Passover uh, from the deliverance from Egypt to be a story of a Passover or a deliverance from sin and, de and a deliverance from death, that Jesus will become their great deliverer. And as they sit down together for this meal, he introduces the sacrament to them. And he says, now I want you to remember what's about to happen. What's about to happen with my body and my blood that will be laid down for you so that you can be set free. And he says, Share this meal with friends and family weekly from now on to remember that you are a people delivered, that you are a people set free. And there was teaching that happened with just that close knit group of Jesus and his disciples about living with the spirit, about um, anticipation of that gift that was going to come in fuller measure, about love and just this really sweet gathering. And then and this in this paper when it says, when he instituted the sacrament, he taught his disciples that they were invited to eat and drink in remembrance of him, that that would be what they would do. And on that night, Jesus will actually leave from that Passover meal and walk with a couple of disciples across the valley into the Garden of Gethsemane, where he will begin his atoning sacrifice there. That all happens on that, on that same day. And... The question that's in this study, it says, how can daily repentance help you honor and remember Jesus Christ? And I think it's interesting when they get into that garden, he says to his disciples, watch and pray here. And it's that almost that same invitation that came from the sacrament. He's like, I want you to watch, watch the things that you're doing and thinking and pray and exercise daily repentance. And we love talking about that mm -hmm. word repentance as being a word that means just turning back to him, like making more room for him in your life, having that like shift where you're going or what you're doing and, and shift it more closer to him. Take something out and bring him more, kind of like in a previous yeah. day that we talked about. And, um, and this is a day that I think we want to really settle into remembering that sacrifice and remembering what he did for us and remembering the chance that we can turn to him whenever we want, that he made that possible for, for all of us um, in both, you know, what happened in the garden of Gethsemane and then tomorrow on the cross and that weekly reminder of that. But it's something we promise every Sunday. I want to remember this all week long. I mm. want this to be a part of my my story all week. And so our invitation on this Thursday, which begins a really set of several holy like contemplative yeah. days, is to spend this day turning again to Jesus. Watch and pray. And one way that we have found that helps us a lot is worshipful music. Maybe today on this Thursday, you will set aside all other kind of music and all other kind of things that you watch on TV or whatever, and really make it a day of turning again to Him, a day of watching and praying and remembering. Um, and fill your, when you drive in your car and when you're just sitting in your house, just fill it with that sacred, mm. worshipful music. music. I love that so much. And as you talked about that, I had an interesting conversation with one of my daughters this week where we were talking about that word repentance. And she said, I don't, I don't want my sins always in front of me to be remembered forever. When, and when she saw the word repentance, that is the thought that came to mm. mind. And I was like, oh, I actually want to like expand what you know about repentance because sometimes repentance is acknowledging sin. But repentance means to turn again, to turn your heart again. And so repentance is diving into scripture. Repentance is prayer. Repentance is sitting in the temple parking lot. Repentance is anything that like shifts a heart. And sometimes it really is evaluating your relationship. And sometimes there is a moment of um, assessing your sins. But sometimes there's just a moment of turning again to scripture or turning again to prayer or 
turning again to uh, meditation about him or a playlist. All of those things are repentance. And this might be a beautiful time to have a conversation about repentance in that shared study that you're doing with family or well, friends. And that's interesting. As you say, turn again to, turn again to, turn again to. All those really mean is turn again to him. And if repentance is, if we have an idea, repentance is a focus on our sins, then we have it backwards mm-hmm. because it's actually a focus on him yes, is what it is. That's and, so good. And the problem was I was so focused on something else, which is the need for, oh, now turn my heart to focus on him instead of whatever this other thing that was capturing my heart is. I know. Don't you want to write that down for every teenager? Repentance isn't a focus on sin. It's a focus. Repentance is a focus on him. Him, right. That's so simple. And that is so true. That's what changes a life. Focusing on the sin will never change a life. But focusing on him will. Right. Amen. So good. Okay, Good Friday, which we don't know why they chose the name Good. Should we start out with that? Um, oh, because well, it's such a sad it's a Friday. Sad day. It's a sad day, so don't what, get your hopes up. But what this comes is Sunday of it? What comes of it is, is so good. good. That's why I think it's but called it's that. It's so sad. Um, this on this day is the day when we are studying the trial, the crucifixion, and the burial of Christ. And this is such a heavy day. Um, sometimes we will go to a Good Friday service. Um, you can find them around the valley. And it really is, you leave there with such a heavy heart. Every time I've been to one, I leave with such a heavy heart. And just a reminder of the sacrifice. That's what Friday rep- represents, is the reminder of that sacrifice. And that whole day goes through. And there's the um, trials, there's the scourging from the um, soldiers, there's going to be nailing to the cross, all of those things take place. But within that day, there's also this little hint of softness or tenderness that we experience from Jesus. And we see it in Luke 23, 34, you, that whole day goes through and it is just heavy. And then... It tells us in verse 33, when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. Um, One on the right hand, one on the left, Jesus in the middle. And then in verse 34, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiments and cast lots. And he's talking about the soldiers in that moment as he looks at him. And I think how on that day that was so heavy, did he still have room in his heart for compassion mm. and forgiveness and, and those things that remind us of who he is? And I think it's interesting to remember forgiveness in this story of Christ and that part of what happened in Gethsemane and on the cross um, enables this power of forgiveness that encompasses all of us, every single one of us. David and I both had the chance to go to the Passion Play this last year in Germany, which is a play um, that starts at, what, did it start at three and it ends at 10 o'clock at night? And yeah, it's hours you, long. You yeah. stop for dinner in the middle. You actually leave the play and then come back. It is so long. It's all in German and it is Holy Week. That's all it is. It just walks you through Holy Week. And it was interesting because I went before David and we made a pact that I wouldn't talk about it till David saw it, <laughs> which was so hard because I came home and there were like so many standouts, but David was like, I want to see how similar our standouts are. And there was one for both of us that was really similar. And in that passion play, they really let you walk through what happens with Peter and what happens with Judas. And you watch Peter go through those three denials of Christ. And within that play, there is this moment of forgiveness. Um, You love that part. Do you remember any details from that conversation? At least in there, the way they portrayed it, we don't have a scriptural evidence of this, but John actually comes to Peter in the way that they played that out and reminds him some of the teachings of Jesus. You know, like Peter runs away, like anguished, you know, and then John comes to him and he just says like, hey, don't you remember what he taught about this? Like, 
we can move forward from this. This can be forgiven. This, yeah, you, you, have, you, you can have a second chance. You will be better yeah. because of this. And it was such a beautiful part of the movie and then, or of the play. And then um, what happens right after is that Judas also runs and he will end up taking his life because of the guilt that he carries with him. And both of us came home from that play. That part is really like tears at your heart. And both of us had thought the same thing. How come no one told Judas? Um, like why did nobody tell Judas about how forgiveness works? And yeah. we both left with that thought of like, okay, who do we need to tell? Who needs to know about um, that compassion and that forgiveness that comes into a life because of Jesus. Um, there's a quote here from Russell M. Nelson that I love. He says, I repeat my call to end the conflicts in your life. Exercise the humility, courage, and strength required both to forgive and to seek forgiveness. I invite you to seek an end to a personal conflict that has weighed you down. Um, could there be a more fitting act of gratitude to Jesus for his atonement? If forgiveness presently seems impossible, plead for power through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ to help you. As you do so, I promise you personal peace. And as I read this quote, I think to myself, and you might remember when he extended this to us, um, is there somebody that you need to forgive? in your life. And I think it is important when we extend this invitation to remind you that forgiving someone completely doesn't mean that you remove protective boundaries that you might have put in place from, from someone who has hurt you deeply or wronged you or from abuse that you might have experienced. But you can experience the power of forgiveness deeply and still have those boundaries put up. And that is, is a good way of moving forward. But I wrote down as I was studying this week when it talks about um, the question here, Jesus Christ is the ultimate example of forgiveness. How can you be more forgiving of yourself and the other people in your life? And I love thinking about that um, invitation from President Nelson to extend forgiveness. And I, I just wrote down, what if the person is you? Mm. Like what if you are the person? Um, that you need to extend forgiveness to. And I love the power of that. Like who needs to know? And maybe it's your own self, or maybe it's somebody um, who has wronged you that needs to know you've forgiven them. And um, to, to also ask that they would respect the boundaries you've put in place. But there is a great power that comes from forgiveness um, and a peace. A yeah. beautiful piece that can come from that. And also like that lesson that we learned watching the Passion Play. I just think answering this question, who needs to know, like go be someone's, you know, messenger that we wish someone had come to Judas, right? Yes. Whether that happened or not, but go let someone know how forgiving and kind and good Christ is. Let them know that they can become better from this. Let them, let them know that there is a second chance that because of what happened on this day, Friday, like good can come, like even from mistakes. Like, and, and from heavy things. Right. Like, mm -hmm. but if you don't have someone to forgive, like, oh, let someone know that forgiveness is possible, that they can experience that for themselves as they forgive others. Be that messenger Yeah. sometime today. All right, Saturday must have just been a, a um, wild day for yeah. the disciples yeah. of Christ. I mean, they had just had these expectations and visions of glory and kingdom and all of these things happening. And then all of a sudden, I mean, they come into Jerusalem for this triumphal, with this triumphal entry that was less than a week ago, <laughs> you know, like, and they just like, this is it, this momentum, this building up. And then all of a sudden he's gone, he's gone. And he's not just, he didn't just disappear. They didn't lose him, but they watched him um, die this brutal and unfair death. And then they rushed his body off of the cross and put him into a borrowed tomb and just shut the rock. And, and then what? I know, you because know? don't you think to yourself sometimes, the last words they hear him say is, it is finished. Yeah. And in their minds, they probably think he's talking about the mission of those three years and the mission of his life and the ministry that they've created, it is finished when in reality, he's telling his 
Father, I finished the plan. I did the thing that had to be done. Right. Um, and we did it. Like, we did it. It's so celebratory up there. But down here, because they just, they didn't have a full perspective of that yet. It's so sorrowful. Yeah. And it's interesting, this line, I just, it gets me when I read this line in the plan. It says, the night before, his body had been lovingly prepared and placed in a garden tomb. Now, they were left to figure out how life could possibly go on without him. Were they behind a locked door? Like thinking, are we next? Like what is actually yeah. happening? And that day, if I were to give Saturday a word from their perspective, it would be despair. That's probably the, the word. And the scripture um, that goes often with Saturday is this verse. It says, so they went and made the sepulcher sure sealing the stone and setting a watch. That's the very last verse of Matthew 27. And you're just, it feels like it's set in stone. It's over, it's done, is the feeling that kind of comes from that. Now, because of what's gonna happen tomorrow, you know, on Sunday, you and I actually see that tomb with the stone there as a symbol of hope. And it's interesting because they are in this moment, this Saturday moment where, you know, they could lean into despair, but the invitation of Easter week is when you have your Saturdays, lean into hope, look mm. toward hope. Um, while they're wondering what's going on and they think it's all over, Jesus's ministry, restoration scripture teaches us, is continuing on. And section 138 is a section of the Doctrine and Covenants um, that gives us where Joseph F. Smith receives a vision of what's happening in that day when he's in the tomb. Now, during Joseph F. Smith's life, when he writes this, which is in the early 1900s, um, they had just come, in the, they're in the middle of World War I, or just coming out of it. The Spanish flu pandemic is happening, and all of us have now lived in a pandemic, but this was worse because there was no medical care. His son has actually died accidentally I from an it, appendix oh, burst. and then... And one of his daughters was really sick, Yeah, right? I mean, it just is this, like, you would say this is a Saturday for him. And I think it's interesting what he does during a time which could easily, he could fall into despair and the stone being sealed and shut. And it says at the beginning of 138, I reflected upon the atoning sacrifice that was made by the Son of God for the redemption of the world and the great and wonderful love made manifest by the Father and the Son in the coming of the Redeemer into the world. And he looks to hope himself on that day. And it kind of sparks this vision that he has of, of the spirit world of people. It says in verse 12, gathered together spirits of the faithful in the testimony of Jesus, who'd offered sacrifice in his similitude. They'd all departed the mortal life, verse 14, firm in the hope of a glorious resurrection through the grace of God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. He says, I beheld they were filled with joy and gladness and rejoicing together because the day of their deliverance was at hand. Hmm. And, and then Jesus does come to them and announces that deliverance and that redemption. And, and I just think this it's, it's beautiful that from this really, really dark scene, actually hope springs forth from it. And um, the question that happens in this study is, when has Jesus helped you find comfort during difficult times? When have you found reason to hope? When have you found reason to have joy? When have you found reason to remember that he takes things that feel like despair and he turns them into pictures of hope eventually? And that's the thing to remember on this Saturday, because maybe you're in a, like a Saturday of life right now where you need to spend time pondering that redemption and that deliverance and really allowing hope to settle in and take her, her place in, in your heart. Um, our invitation for this one is those white lilies that we talked about at the beginning to go buy some of those. Easter lilies have a name that's been given to them, a nickname, and they are sometimes called and should always be called, by the way, I think, the white-robed apostles of hope. And how awesome. What They will already be bloomed when you buy them, probably. But I think it's neat to remember that they come from this within the dark soil and they spring forth into to something beautiful. And just to remember that 
because of him, that is what every life can look like. If your life looks like a sealed shut tomb right now, you just remember this, this story that it ends in, it ends in victory. So in between the sad and the victory is a day of hope and not despair. And that's mm. what we want you to spend this day remembering. I love that. That's so good. And then we get to the last day, which is Easter Sunday. And I love Easter Sunday so much. And, and if you're watching this on Easter, happy, happy Easter. Easter. <laughs> yes. Um, I love Easter Sunday so much. Um, we remember the story when Mary goes to the tomb and she goes weeping, right? She's still in that despair when she gets there and the stone has been rolled away and now things are worse than they were when she was walking there because now Jesus isn't even there. So where does she go for solace and for yeah. prayer and, and you know, for all of those things because he's gone. And there's that moment when she turns around and starts talking to who she thinks is the gardener, which I actually love. The symbolism in the fact that where her mind went to was to someone who actually knows how to resurrect life out of the ground mm. is so powerful mm. to me, right? The gardener knows the Easter lily is going to come forth. And I just, yeah. I think it's so sweet that she just expects him to be the gardener and he actually is, Yeah, you know? And she realizes that he is Jesus. He says her name, Mary. And then it says this it, in the... Um, lessons that we've been studying. It was Jesus Christ alive again. The knowledge was too wonderful to contain. And for the most part, I love scripture. I know that's a big shocker because I have a favorite <laughs> everywhere. And, and there's always verses or chapters or whatever. But I sometimes want to say to John, this is all we get from Mary leaving this moment is this one thing. It says this, he says, I'm going to ascend back to my father and your father and to my God and your God. And then in verse 18, it says, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, no, are you dying to be like, and then she ran back as fast as she could. And she was like, let me in. You guys are not going to believe what just happened. You know, there is that moment that, I just want to see what her witness was. I want to read what her witness is. I miss that that is not in scripture. Where is Mary's like witness of that moment? And that is the other thing that I loved about the Passion Play. Um, if you have not been to the Passion Play before, I'm about to spoil it for you because Jesus does not come back at the end of the play. He dies and he's carried away and there is that mourning that takes place, mourning by M-O-U-R-N, that sadness Saturday, that takes yeah. place. And then um, it all ends and you, you don't ever get to see him resurrected. And it could leave you wanting, except for there is this powerful moment when Mary comes and she's coming to tell you what happened, what she knows. And it's the most powerful moment for me. Um, and I don't know why it was so powerful. I can remember asking you when you came home if it had been as powerful for you as it was for me. But all that happens is Mary comes and she stands right at the front of the stage and she just stands there. And her arms are out and, and she's in a pose that is just like strength. Yeah, like a conviction. Pose, yes, you right. just feel it it's so clearly. And she just stands there and she just stares at the audience. And then the choir behind her begins to sing. And there is something about her witness unsaid that was so powerful for me. And the reminder that the first witness of the risen Lord was a woman. And I love the power that comes from that. In our family, we have a tradition my son Caleb brought home from Serbia with him. He served his mission there. And in Serbia, they will dye Easter eggs red on the day of, that is gonna be their big family Easter dinner. And they will dye these eggs red. And 
then it's the tradition on that night. Because in Serbia, there was a time where they couldn't talk about church and they couldn't talk about Jesus and they couldn't share testimony. And so on Easter, they would hide behind closed doors, locked, and they would dye these Easter eggs together. And then it was the job of the grandmother or whoever was the oldest woman in the house to teach the children and the family about Jesus and about belief in Jesus. And I love that witness. I love the thought about that witness. So in our home on Easter dinner, when we all gather around, whoever is the oldest woman in the home will share her testimony of Jesus Christ. And there is a red egg by every single seat that we put out. For anyone who's coming over for dinner on Easter, we will spend the day before decorating these eggs so that everybody will get their own. And then this egg stays out um, at my house on the, well, now I keep out several because I love that night so much. It's one of my favorite nights of the year, but we will have one on our fireplace mantle and I have one at my kitchen sink. And then I have one, um, a, a little handful of them by my front door right when you walk in because I love the reminder of that witness, of that Easter witness. And you can keep these eggs all year and they'll be fine. They won't, um, you think your house is gonna start to smell, but it doesn't, as long <laughs> as you don't break it. It can just stay out for a whole year. These are my last year eggs. Um, so we'll be on conference weekend, we will be making our eggs again as we prepare for that next Easter Sunday, which will be the week after conference. Um, but I love this reminder, and if this is something you want to do, it's really easy. You just need to get the skins from yellow onions. They're kind of that brown skin, and you boil the skins in water first, and then you let the water cool. And the red will be much deeper red if you use brown eggs to begin with. And then you just put those eggs in, and then you'll turn the water on and hard boil them the way you do, but with the skins in there this time. And then they need to sit for 24 hours, and then you rub olive oil on them after they've dried. Um, oh, sit for 24 hours in the water. Then you get them out and let them dry. Then you rub the olive oil on them. So hopefully that makes sense. But anyways, I love that tradition. I love that witness. Um, and in the study, on this day, the question is, what feelings do you experience when you think about Jesus Christ's resurrection? And that might be a really awesome Sunday dinner um, question to just go around the table and let everyone just talk about what feelings um, come to you because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and just let everyone say two or three words that um, they think of could be such a just a, a night that you will remember and a, a sacred and holy experience at the end of Easter week. Yeah, and I love that you leave them out all year. There's this line in the study that says about her, her faith propelled her into a joyous sprint as she ran to tell the others. And then this line, it's a testimony that still propels people today. Mm. That really we come back to this first initial witness, right? And when I watched that play, I remember thinking she was standing there and I didn't see Jesus but I was like, oh, but I, but this is actually the reality that I live. I am looking to these first witnesses, you know, to propel my faith forward, to propel yeah. me to, you know, to seek my own witness. You know, it's like witnesses, faith is always passed down. Yeah. It's passed down from person to person. And, um, and I think this day, Easter is a day that can propel our faith for the next year that we live out. Like come back and remember the stories and the things you felt this week and let them be that energy um, and that, and just the, the spirit that will define what your, what your next year um, looks like. This is, this is a, our highest and holiest day. This day, Easter Sunday is what makes us uh, Christian. Yes. It, defines our, it defines our faith. We are a people who believe in the, uh, a God who sent his son, who loved us enough to send his son to lay down his life, um, that he might heal us and, and bring us forth in uh, one day, you know, that we can live in that, in, in the hope of, of that for all of our days here mm. in the earth, whatever, whatever may happen. But this is what defines us as a people. And 
We are so happy to celebrate um, Easter together with you. See you next week.